Good evening, everybody. How are you? It's too loud. Don't like this mic. Welcome you all for this evening program. Today we have an exciting session here planned for the industry tonight. On, uh, I'm first like to introduce uh, Dr. Mukti Kulru. Uh, a privilege and honor to have him here. And uh, he's been uh, in the industry more than 15 plus years. Uh, he's currently building an institute of called the International School of Engineering. And uh, in the last three years, he's been building this as a co-founder. And uh, this is basically a place, if you want to learn applied engineering, this is one of the best places in the country. And, uh, and he has been with the DRDO previously and also a part of an education company called Globarina. He has a master's and PhD degree from Karimbalan University and bachelor's from uh, Ali Situchi. And uh, we're privileged and honored to have him here, Dr. Mukti. He's going to talk about big data science so as relevant for product engineering leaders. Welcome. Hello. So while he's uh, setting it up, uh, how many of you have heard the term big data analytics? Good. How many of you used it somewhere? Good. Okay. Um, that's uh, what I will try to do today is uh, probably introduce, I, I, I have an introduction about my talk in a moment, but let me just explain a bit about my uh, background so that you know what you can expect from this session. I did not study analytics in the university setting. So I actually studied a field called material science, where uh, I learned how to make a lot of apps. So, um, and I worked for defense. First 15 years of my uh, professional life, I spent, I spent with atoms. Somehow, something happened, not planned, and I moved from atoms to bits, got into computer science from uh, uh, material science. Uh, but that, uh, from then onwards, I've been practicing uh, machine learning, data science, and I learned everything on the job. So uh, my learning of uh, uh, data science is very hands-on, irregular, uh, what was needed at that time, and I picked up. So till 2010, that used to be the case. Mm, but in 2010, once I started the institute, I had to teach, right? So then I went back to sort of online uh, learning schools and studied and picked up. Now I do some serious data science uh, theory also. But uh, what I want to cover is an essence of things that I learned in the uh, practice so that uh, you see the relevance and applicability. Thank you very much. So, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time building rockets and studying rocket science. So today, one of my biggest goals is to show you that data science is no rocket science. Okay, it can be practiced fairly easily. It's a lot of common sense, intuition. Yes, there is some math also, but yeah, that that can be you know that is uh, uh, a manager or someone who wants to take the role of a data smart manager uh, can pick it up fairly easy. And that's what I want to do, prove to you. And mind you, I will prove to you by taking you through models and algorithms. I'm not going to be um, touching, you know, doing a, a high-end talk. I will actually walk you through the very basic, like, logistic regression to extremely advanced thing like deep learning, and show you, probably, hopefully, that it's not a sense. Second and very equally important uh, thing that I want to establish today is to show you that a successful data science execution happens when there is a perfect synergy between the math gain and the physics gain. You know, uh, unfortunately, in most of the uh, data science initiatives in companies, there is a math team and there is a business team. They don't know what, uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about and vice versa. Um, many times when um, I work with companies like IBM and Microsoft, I ask the guys, you know, you have an R&D lab there, and I read their papers and learn. Why do you call me? You two can talk to each other, right? 
They will say, no, we don't know what we are saying. They don't know what we are saying. So, you know, uh, let us see whether you have any uh, magic portion. So, uh, it's uh, very, very important for successful execution of the projects that these two are start. And I want to establish that through a use case that I worked on, uh, both these factors. And hopefully in the next 40 minutes, you will uh, uh, gain an understanding of how we think as data scientists and how business users should, can start thinking uh, to solve some of these problems. The specific use case that I am going to take is a problem that we solved for a um, e-commerce company. So this is a company that makes products like iPads. Um, the only difference is the products are aimed at kids with educational and playing uh, game, gaming kind of things. So the customer in this case is the parent. The consumer is the kid. And uh, this is a very successful company with lots of uh, um, hundreds of thousands of customers. The problem they gave to us is looking at my customers for the first one or two months, how they engage with us and what they buy, how they go about. Can you tell me how much money they are likely to give me in the next couple of weeks? In the management parlance, it's called customer life pressure. The day I meet a customer, can I actually know how valuable the man is? Can you see why that is useful to a business user? You know, if I know who are good customers and who are bad customers, there are two things that I can do. Number one, I can spend less time on the bad customers and try to actually maximize the use of, you know, make the good customer pay even more. More importantly, I can figure out how I can convert a bad customer into a good customer. And if I know it in advance, uh, the advantage is tremendous, right? So it's a very important business problem. Uh, very complicated one. It's almost like magic, right? First uh, one month of that customer's care, you tell how much money you will get in the next couple of days. Very difficult to solve it in any other uh, framework. Let's see how data scientists solve it. And they gave us data of uh, around 100,000 customers over five years. Now, in this case, this became a um, very large data problem because they not only gave us the purchase details of the customers, they actually gave how the kids are playing the games. On November 23rd morning, 7 o'clock, kids started playing game X. Um, and then, uh, kid, uh, then, then the game is changed to game Y after 20 minutes. We had every game that the kid played every day for two to three years till they played it. That's a lot of data as you can see. And then, the point of sale data, when they bought a game, what game they bought, when, what credit card they used, all that stuff. And some demographics. Where did this kid buy the game from? Where are the parents living? How many kids are there in the far family? Whatever demographic data they have. Now, in the data science world, we call all of them attributes, right? That hopefully can tell me about the final outcome that I have. What, what is it that I am hoping for? Maybe there is a pattern. Like, if the family has two kids, and the parents are very young, um, and they are in IT field, and they play game uh, X more often, they will get a lot more money than some other family. Now, I don't know why, but that's what the data says. Across 100,000 uh, families and 500,000 kids over five years, that's what they give more money. So I may as well believe that they give more money. So data science is all about finding these patterns that are very difficult for a human um, uh, user to just look at the data. So we write mathematical models that actually predict these, uh, uh, these underlying patterns. And we'll see how we do. But that, that's what we do at some level, that's as simple as that. We hope that a lot of attributes that we know help us predict an attribute that's very different. And we hope that that's very simple and easy to do. So to do that, what we do is we imagine the data in simple graphs. Okay. Now, what am I 
I doing here? I have taken historical data of every one of these customers. I group them into two classes, a high revenue guy, low revenue guy. And I'm representing the high revenue person as the dark circle, low revenue guy as an empty circle. So all the past customers, I am taking their first one month behavior. Whatever this is, you know, this could be uh, the number of times they played the game, this could be the number of product they sold, whatever they are, you know, some features that I collected in the first two months about each customer. And in the next two years, did they give a lot of money or did they give it? So we try to represent this graphically. And uh, what is the complexity? This, if it is just two dimensions, it's very easy. But as I said, these guys gave me so many attributes, like the, uh, 50 attributes, the point of sale data, the demographics. So this is essentially a 50 dimensional graph. That's why data scientists get paid what they get. You know, they actually visualize things in 50 dimensions, 100 dimensions, and 20 dimensions. But you will get the bigger picture just by looking at three dimensions. Now, let's say this is the past data of you do, I know you have to now help me solve this problem. Um, this is the past data of 100,000 customers based on two attributes. This I collected in the first two months. And then, because it's past data, I know how much money they gave in two years. These are high revenue viewers, these are low revenue viewers. If I find now a new customer, okay, whose first month I collected these two values, and that guy falls here. That guy is a black, uh, is, is a low triangle here. I don't know whether he will be a low uh, income giving guy or a high income revenue giving guy. He falls here. What is your guess? Would he give less revenue or more? Why is that? Belongs to that. Well, how did you say he belonged to that? What did you do to say that? I know you are absolutely right, but the you know, visually you know this guy is close. Visually you know this guy is close, but in twenty dimensions and fifty dimensions I can't visualize this. So I have to do something, and it's a very simple thing. What do you think I can do? If, if a guy is here, what do you think? Will he give more money or less money? More money. More money. How can you say? Closer. Okay. One way I can say, and tell me whether I'm right or wrong, is I draw a line, separating them. And I say, anyone in future, now I ignore all the data. If a new point falls on this side, I say, hey, this guy will give a lot of money. If it falls on this side, I say, hey, he will give less money. Do we agree with that one? Anyone who objects to it, despite the object. Yeah, it is in fact a very, very popular standard technique. By the way, when you hear that term, if at all you hear that term logistic regression, this is exactly what they are doing. They are just drawing a line. Nothing complex. They just take the data, draw a line in between. And from then onwards, they say if it is on one side, they say they are good customers, the other side, they say they are bad customers. Um, even if the engineer scares you that the equation of this line is 1 by 1 plus e power minus, you just tell him, no, I know it's just a straight line. You know, you just draw a straight line or a plane, you know, depending on my dimension, you draw a, you know, a drawing is a bit more, you know, there are more attributes, but essentially it's just a straight line. Now, what is the advantage of drawing this line and actually classifying it? I now have to take you to one of your, uh, uh, you know, high school times. Just to, uh, I, I promise you I won't do any equations, etc. But this is really a simple equation. Straight line. A H plus B dot plus C. You guys are okay? That's fine. Okay. So the beauty of this is I get this line in the form of an equation like this. Probability that is high value is A X X here is H, B by Y is income, C Z Z is something. You know, some simple equation. Now, what is the advantage of having this equation? H has a negative coefficient. No, it means if H goes up, the probability of him being valuable goes down. Uh, income has a small positive thing. So if income goes up, probability goes up slightly. Number of kids is much bigger question. So if kids goes up, uh, the probability goes up even further. So he, as a sales guy, I will look at parents who are very young, whose income is good, but who have lots of kids. They are the guys I should run off. So a business user has an actionable insight from a line equation. 
right? I mean, you can't ask for anything more. Uh, and this is fairly simple to do. I mean, uh, doing is, I, I'm not that worried about doing it uh, because there are 100 guys who can do it. Um, what is more important is consume that result. Once they do it, how do I actually make use of that? Now, this is one form of all. This is not the only way to solve it. There is another way to solve it. And that is, in logistic regression, I try to draw one single line, right? Computer scientists, by definition, cannot handle such complex thing. <laughs> you know, even this is, uh, even for computer scientists, this is a very scary thing. Probably statisticians do a good job of it, but uh, computer scientists still want a shortcut. So what they do is, let me draw a line parallel to the axis. I can't handle angles. Parallel is easy, you know, ax plus by plus c is too complex. y is equal to 2 is much more simple. x is equal to 3 is a lot more simple. So let me draw one parallel. Such that most of the empty guys are on one side, most of the dark guys are on the other side. I know there is some error. Some dark guys fall in this side, some empty guys fall in this side, because I chose to draw. But okay, let me draw that. Now let me take it the, look at the left side, divide it into another bucket. Now let me look at the right side, divide it into another bucket. What I have done here, I have split the space into multiple buckets where each bucket has very similar customers. This bucket has all non-revenue givers. This bucket has all revenue givers. This has non-revenue givers. This has revenue givers. So, entire space now is a collection of these buckets. And those buckets then, uh, you know, once I know each bucket. Now, any new customer, he falls in this bucket, I say, yeah, he's likely to give a lot of money. He falls in, she falls in this bucket, I'll say, no, she's not a very this is another extremely popular technique. If you heard the term decision key, that's what they do. They divide the space into multiple markets. Why is this so exciting? Decision tree is in fact one of the most favorite techniques for data scientists and business users. Why it is is, now let me read, define this bucket, okay? What am I saying? Essentially, this bucket is if attribute 1 is between this and this, and attribute 2 is between this and this. I am writing the output, that bucket is a simple if then rule. And it is like saying if age is between 20 and 30, and if income is between 100 and 200k, then they buy. The output is a simple loop like this. If parents are old, number of kids is less, and I'm just writing a dummy. Uh, and income is less, then they don't give a lot. Now, this is so much easier than an equation for a business. So that's why the people, the, the challenge for a data scientist is not actually as much about drawing these equations or building these uh, buckets. The challenge is to present the output in a form that the business users understand. And that's why decision trees are very popular. This is something that the business user can consume very easily. And now he can see, hey, if it is low, what can I change to make it high? If the parents become young, will it be high? I can do that filtering and testing automatically. I can do what this. I can get knowledge that I was not aware of, even uh, slightly uh, without this one. So that is the exciting aspect of, uh, uh, of actually doing data science models. Now, all the base models that you probably listen to are really simple things like this. Yes, mathematics is needed because you are dealing with many more dimensions than two or three that you can graphically. But if the world had everything depended on only two or three things, all data science is actually drawing graphs and drawing lines or buckets. You could visually do it. You need math and more matrices because you deal with the uh, uh, more dependent attributes. There is one more complexity, and this is where business and data scientists start, start, uh, start hating each other. Is uh, that good and bad guys are, uh, you know, in real world, they are not nicely separated. All good guys on one side, all bad guys on one side. We like that, but that doesn't matter. Now, what will you do? What kind of, how will you even divide it into buckets and all this? Okay, the data scientists started solving problems like this 
uh, you know, in the mid to the 80s or the early 90s. And then the mathematician in the data science rose up and said, you know what, I will actually draw a curve like this. And you know, I can, you know, we will give the business user, it is nothing but e to the power of tan cot, uh, you know, by log x squared. You just handle that and do whatever you want. What does that mean? You know, but now, I, I actually, next um, 15 minutes or so, I want to spend time explaining how this is done also. I want you to walk through, you know, as a business user also, you should appreciate how the data scientists draw something as complex as this. You know, there's a lot of thought that went into it, and it's, it's nice to know. And then I will also talk about how a business user should contribute to avoid this. Okay, both sides will that. Now the first question is, why do you need, this is, by the way, this is called a non-linear model. For, because it is non-linear. Previously we were all dealing with lines and spiked lines, right? Whereas here I am dealing with something extremely curly. And so I call it non-linear. So why do I need non-linear models? Do I really need non-linear models in here? Let me start with a small example. Let me take two examples actually. The first one is, uh, let's say you, after this session, you are going out and you played poker with a guy on the board and you won the game. Okay. And uh, you, the bet was for 30 rupees and you, you, you won 30 rupees. But that guy said, hey, you know what? Let's play one more game. This time, there are two options for you. Take 30 rupees for Or uh, let's pass a coin. If it's heads, I'll give you 100 rupees. If it stays, I will not give it. You lose it. So you want 30, you could walk out with 30, but that guy has a big challenge. I pass a coin. If it says, I'll give you 100. If it stays, I'll not give it. How many of you will take the bet? One? That's it. 30 rupees, man. 130. <laughs> okay, you said you will take it. Let me. Now, the situation has changed. You are in Las Vegas. You played a, um, you know, whatever, the high the rolling table. You won $30 million. Now, the casino guy said, <laughs> let's play another game, let's pass a coin. It's heads, I'll give you 100 million. It's tails, I'll give you zero. What will you do? 30 million. Maybe Bill Gates will take a car, toss there also. Only 30 million. Now, what is this? But then he might change his mind at 30 million. The point is, think about it. For a computer, it's exactly the same problem. We just multiplied all sides with 10,000 or million or 10 million. 30, 100, 0. 30 million, 100 million, 0. We just multiplied. But human behavior changed abruptly. Absolutely non linear. So when you're trying to model human behavior, you cannot expect everything to be linear. Because we are non linear animals. Right? And everything that we do is non-linear. He shoots, eats, and leaves. Who am I talking about? Salman Khan. Dinner, camera, you know, he just shoots inside and leaves. Or maybe I'm talking about a deer. It's just small karma. He eats, shoots, and leaves. Dhamma shoots and leaves. Right? The language that we created is not one karma changes the entire meaning. You know, one uh, um, the, everything that we do is not. So, uh, because data science is so realistic, it tries to at least predict human behavior to human things, you cannot avoid this. So, at least sympathize your data scientist when he's studying with non linear. You know, uh, it's not many times I have these arguments with the calculate users. They say, you bring in this non linear part because you want to scale. And I know that's not the reason, sir, because you know, you are non linear. What can I do? You know, and that's it. You know, we are shaped now for that. You know, so uh, that's that's now how does a data scientist actually handle something as nonlinear as this? It's very simple. What they do is they actually one of the methods, they actually divide the data into small sets like this. Okay. Now look at closely these sets. I can actually build a simple linear model. I did my largest implementation here. 
another one here. Completely different, but each one I have in here one. And then I combine all of them. This is one of the most popular techniques called ensembles to deal with non-linearity. In 1999 it was invented. Very, very powerful, very, very accurate. Very simple. Another one, which is uh, by Faber. Look at this data. Can I actually build a linear model to separate green and red? Can I draw a line anywhere here that separates green from red? All green should be one side, all red should be on the side. Can you draw? If I draw here, there are some green and some red. Do you think I can draw anywhere? A line? No, even this simple thing cannot be done linearly. Only way I can do is a non-linear circle. When I say everything inside is uh, green and outside is green. Now, imagine if I square it. This is a beautiful insight. This is, a, this is one of the most elegant things in data science, actually, according to many machine learning things. Just let me square it. Now, can I separate linearly? Yeah. So, a great man called Rapnik in 1995 realized that if I take the data and square it cubic or take it to i powers, however non-linear it may be originally, it becomes linear in those high power things. And then draw a linear thing and project it back. He did elegant mathematics to do that, but that's uh, one of the most advanced techniques support by machines. When your uh, data science teams, if at all you are working with a true data scientist, this is one of the cutting edge. Um, you know, they say I'm using support by machines, that's all they're doing. They're just squaring it, drawing a line. You know, and the last one I want to introduce you to is uh, uh, a realization that all non-linearities are not scaled. And for example, this is a simple cup. And in, the, in mathematics, it's called quadratic equation. And you have x squared, x squared. That's all. This is not too scary. This is this is okay. Now, what these guys figured out is, however ugly and non-linear original thing may be. It can be written as sum of cups and lines, cups and lines. If you see, this is a cup, then I can draw a line here, line here, then a cup, then line, line, cup, line. Any complicated thing is the sum of cups and lines, cups and lines, linear and nonlinear. And they uh, invented, this is called deep learning, where I start with all my features, every circle I add a small cup or line. Just add a cup or a line. And every circle I keep adding that, finally, by, when I, by, by the time I come here, completely ugly non-linear Right, now why I took you through this? What the output may look as ugly and as unbelievable as this, but the math guy underlying is not doing anything different or illogical. He's just using some simple logic like combining multiple simple models, or taking it to a high dimension and bringing it back, or adding cups and lines to build an extremely complex. But in data science families, these are called black box models. Because you cannot understand why, you can only understand what is happening. So the original problem, will this customer give more money or less money? Okay, give me all the features about that guy. His age, gender, how many times he played, what he did, how he did, you know, we have 50 features, right? Put them into this equation. I don't know what it is, but the complex black box. Out comes he is good, or he is bad. Does it, is it okay to just know the output? Is it okay to know? What do you think? No, you, you just you just tell me, okay, put yourself in the shoes of a business leader and tell me, I you ask me, hey, will uh, this customer be good or bad? Tell me whether this customer is good or bad at the end of two years. Will you give a lot of money or less money? I say with 100% confidence or very high confidence, this guy will give a lot of money, this guy will not give a lot of money, this guy will give a lot of money. Is it any way? Oh, I'm going to put a business in. Yes. So he's, he believes it's any way. What about the. Uh, very high confidence, let's say 90%. I don't know the future. You don't know the future about the other person. Yeah, but for that feature, he's a good guy or a bad guy. So, one good thing he's saying is, what he's saying is, I know for this customer, he's good or bad, but I also as a marketer want to know, 
this is actually what the customer asked me. When, when I came in, the existing team actually built a wonderful nonlinear model like this. And they were telling me the 90% confidence whether the customer is good or bad. But what they asked me is, how will I convert the bad customer to a good customer? What do I change here I, 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 to get a good customer? I don't know, they are saying this is like, you know, a complex 5003 ensemble model. So what is this? How do I deal with it? So there are some cases where the bot of knowledge is enough. But there are some cases why also is needed. Now, as a business user, you have to know whether this problem is okay with just what of knowledge. Now, there are some problems where what is enough? Recognizing face. Let's say I'm writing a computer program that recognizes face. Tomorrow, you see me, you know, oh, yeah, I met this guy yesterday. How do you know? How are you recognizing me as me? Any idea? What features? No, they, they, love, they love it. I have to write a program for the computer. What facial features? The height, the height, the height. The height. Tell me all the features that you think you will use. Specs or not. So, someone with specs, 510, um, very little hair, uh, reasonably fair. There are million of them, but still you won't be confused. So, you are seeing something else. What structure? The ratio of the, the ratio of the, the ratio of the, what is the ratio sir? <laughs> uh, so we don't even know what we are seeing. So that, that's an important that there are some problems we seem to be solving without even knowing how we are solving it. You know what? You mean, let's say you spend in this class five months or six months or one year with each other. You meet them after 15 years. Within few minutes, you will actually recognize. So, if we go by his logic, you are doing a time series on the facial features, all these <laughs> which is wonderful, right? I'm sure brain is not doing all that. There is some other magic. Let's not get into that. Only point I want you to take there is that is a problem where I don't really need to know why. Because I myself don't know how I am doing it. As long as the computer does it accurately, I am okay. But on the other hand, in a problem like this, I have a problem where I am diagnosing whether the patient has cancer or not. I need to know why also. I can't go to the doctor and tell, believe me, my, my model told this guy has cancer, just treat him. Yeah. Don't care, he will give up everything. Because, you know, believe the mathematics. No, it won't work. You have to tell the doctor in the language that the doctor understands. Right? So as a business user, you have to make a decision when you look at a problem. Whether it is a bot, whether bot is enough, or you have to have violence. Now, that was the conflict here. These guys did a phenomenally nice mathematical data science problem. I couldn't have extended it any further. So, but only thing is, yeah, the business guys had a problem. So they said, look, we are not understanding. And so in such cases, what I normally try to do, and it works most of the times, I encourage you also to do, you don't really need any morning to do what I am going to talk about in the next few minutes. Uh, but I encourage you. I search for any angle where I can look at where the data, instead of looking like this, will look like this in the new angle. So in attribute 1 and 2, yes, it is complex, but are there any other attributes where it becomes nicely clean in some way? Okay. And this is an idea to process. There's no right or wrong answer. So when I actually take a data science problem, first few weeks, I don't do any models. I don't, you know, it, it's an art to actually immediately start writing a third order differential equation, but it doesn't really matter. Right? So uh, what I try to do is, is there any other attribute that I can create and with that angle, the data is nice and subtle? Can I build a simple one? In this case, what I did was I looked at all this data, 50 attributes. Now they were playing, the, I, I was given all the game playing data. How many, how many games they when they played each game, they stand. So I created a new attribute called did they have a favorite game? So if a family played a single game more than 50% of the time, they have a favorite game. If the family had doesn't play multiple games together, they play, they don't have a favorite game. 
Now, the second one, the business user actually told me, if the family has two kids, two families, one family has 88 exits here, the other family has 18 exits, it will be very different here. So I took the range of cases, you know, what is the difference between the uh, biggest and the youngest and the youngest kid? Interestingly, what I found is it didn't make any difference. Whether the age gap is two years or 16 years, the eldest is behaving like that. You know? Uh, but the business user, he said, they, no, he said that may be an important thing. Then I also looked at when did they buy the first draw, you know, did they buy it in January or February, what was the season? I'll tell you that. Like that, we created 50 additional attributes, and of them, 45 were not used. That's a different issue. But first one week, we just sat business user and data scientists, and we brainstormed what are all the additional features that I can generate from this existing set of features. They gave when they played a game. From that, I can generate how much time they played a game, and know whether they are addicted to a single game or not. And then like this, you know, from the children, I can do the age gap between children. From when they are bought, I can figure out first time when they bought, next time when they are fine. All these 50 or 60 additional attributes. Any data science project I take nowadays, first one or two weeks, I only spend on understanding and creating these attributes. And that's not data science, that is common sense. You just have to sit and figure that out. Now, as I said, this is how I define. Now, some interesting things that we found. This is actually a feature, a, a insight that I thought they would know. Uh, they knew that 27% of their customers are from UK and 73% are from US, this particular one. But when I looked at top 10% of the customers, the change from 73 to 94, US has 94%. Top 10 is who gave the highest revenue. If I looked at the best customers, US is doing a lot more uh, better than UK. Okay. Now this is this is an interesting thing from a data center. What should I do with this? I know now my best customers are from US. What should I do with it? Focus on the US. Focus more on US. Is that what you said? No. Focus on UK. Why US? Why, why US is doing well and the replica, why UK is not doing well? Focus, okay. focus on US data, find the SAT and understand the attributes that are similar to the UK data and understand how good. a good customer uh, can be identified in Yeah, no, nice. I'll give you, I'll come back to this in a moment. How much time do we have? Yeah, on the 20th. On the 20th, right? So I'll just diverge a bit and give you one more nice example. Mm, uh, this is a very important point about data. So around 30 years back, IBM did similar analysis on data of Walmart and came up with an insight that people who buy Dow Souls also buy Bonkinons. Don't ask me why. They found that out that has a lot of uh, support in the data. So now they had a meeting like this where they had all Walmart shop floor managers and they asked them, what will you do with this insight? People who buy the shops also buy Walmart. What will you do with it? If you were Walmart the shop floor manager, what would you do? Let's go one by one. How will keep these products in a closer place, nearby place? So she will put both these products near to each other so that the picking will be easy. Good, very good. Yes, sir. I would try to find out the reason behind it. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, can we? That's the whole point. We can't. People, the data is saying 90% of the times when they pick Dowsa, they are also picking Barbie Dowsa. But we don't know the reason. It's, it's quite possible. So, what, what she's saying is 90% of the people are buying both together. So, let's make it easy for them. Give a deal, a discount. Can someone be more wicked? Ah, so they say put it as away as possible because 90% of purchases anyway happen at the impromptu. So the guy walks across the entire store and he pulls out so many more things. Good. Actually, if you think about if I am the brand manager of a rival group uh, to Dow, you know what is as rightly I would pointed out. 
What is so great about soap and uh, barbita? You know, the, so there is something that I don't know that can't be with doubt. That must be having something with soap, right? So let me make my soap in the shape of a barbita. <laughs> I could do that. Now, what is the lesson here? Data science tells you the knowledge, gives you the knowledge. It doesn't tell you what to do. All you can do as a data scientist is to know that Dow Soap's buyers also buy Barbados. It's a lot of confidence. Yeah. Actually, I would say because probably they want the short code, they put it together. That is why the outcome is like that. Actually, they have validated that. That, that, that was not the case. That was not the case. They, they validated that. There is a mystifying of you know, so it can, yeah, but at that time you have to at least understand because this is really historic data. Yeah. So historic, it's the data. Now you go to the shop store and see exactly like historic they, how these two things have been placed together. Exactly. They validated that across hundreds of stores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no. I, what, the, what I could also take on that way is if that is somehow we can relate that yes. if, the, if, the, if the location of one item and the other item matter, then essentially I can also do the do the same thing with so, other exactly. I I did get it those details, but actually they did it in hundreds of shops where the placements are completely different from each other and still they found the correlation. So it was thoroughly tested, identified hypothesis. So the point here is, the point is, you know, data science tells you what to, what it is, but it doesn't tell you what to do with it. Same thing here, when I presented this to the customer, the customer, one segment of them said, let us focus on what is the US doing, what is it that we are doing right in US, so that we can replicate that model in UK and go for it. Then there is other segment that said, ignore UK, what, when we are doing so well in US, why dilute now? Let's focus on our winning market, do the right thing. First, interesting thing is, I thought this would be an obvious thing for a company that is in business for five and a half years. But the magnitude of the data that is happening, 100,000 customers or 150,000 customers doesn't allow the day-to-day -day practitioner to look at even such simple things. That's why there's a need for a specialist manager who always asks the questions for the data. Doesn't rely on heuristics. In fact, uh, I was in Progressive Insurance recently. They had a big poster, in God we believe, rest bring data. You know, so managers are asked to look at data like this, ask questions. More and more, the tendency is increasing. People have to not rely simply on their heuristics. We'll come to that later. Something as simple as this is missed for five years. I mean, why do you need someone else to actually bring it to them? So that it just it happens because you get lost in your day-to-day -day work. Someone has to just sit and ask. Now, this one, on the other hand, is a very, very nice insight. The red guys here are those who played a single game in the first one. Blue guys are those that played a uh, multiple games in the first one. And this is the revenue in next two years. So what it says is, those who play a single game in the first one month give one third or one fourth as much revenue as those who play many games in the first one. This is, uh, this was an immediately actionable insight. So the moment we showed this, they said, yeah, this, is interesting. So in, now we are giving one game or two games as free trial without hardware purchase. Let's give 10 games. Let them get addicted to as many games as possible because the likelihood that we get a lot more money increases after the first one. This is another very interesting thing. When they gave us the problem, they told us ignore January and uh, ignore any month other than January and December. All of our sales happen only in January and December. Which is what the data says also. You know, this February, March, and all, you can see they are negligible. Christmas and New Year seem to be the driving force. So they said ignore. But data scientist or data smart manager never goes by heuristic. Okay. So what we said is okay, let me, yeah, first sell, Jan, December, thing. But what happens to cross sell and upsell? You are familiar with the terms cross sell and upsell. It's later purchase. Actually, those who buy in January and December are the worst guys for upsell. Then when we showed this result to them, summer is your best month if you want to upsell. They said, ah, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Because in December and January, people are in a gift buying frenzy. 
They just buy a gift for their neighbor or good name, nephew or whoever. They don't track that. Here, the parent is considering 10 other products for his or her son or daughter. Picking this particular product, thinking this will be better. So they are ensuring that they play. And then hence they are reusing, buying more and becoming better customers. So this is one thing that have, this is the best thing that can happen with the data science approach. You look at the data, come up with an easy insight, and then you actually understand why it is happening, so that you can act on it, or you can do things related to that. Now the new upsell and cross sell has to happen with uh, um, you know these guys. If I have to promote a new product on a small segment, I might as well take those from someone. Now, action point, one very, very important lesson that um, it's not me, this is established already, is great model or incomplete data always leads us to simple model on extensive data. Those who have more data always And now that's why uh, the companies like WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp and Facebook and Google are valued so high. Amazon. Amazon is not a book selling company. If it is just a book selling company, Flipkart, why is Flipkart six billion dollars? And they sell books at three percent margin. I must be making losses. Why are they valued at six billion dollars? Any cards? They actually know how Indians buy and sell. That is their value, not the shipping a good. Why is Amazon so valuable? Because they know why did the box up? Um, uh, why is it bought for two billion dollars by Facebook? They know exactly how people react to messages. You know, now that can be used. So, the idea here is those who have a lot of data, and of course, then corollary is those who know how to look at it deep, always win compared to those who do a lot of analytics. In fact, when I was in college, they used to do this joke what is the difference between a, a mathematician and a large pizza? Any thoughts? They said if a large pizza can feed a family of four. Mathematician can. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, that used to be the plight of data. Thanks to data science, situation is changing now. Uh, even bigger jobs. Uh, uh, you know, but the, the point is spend time on data. You, you know, data science definitely there's great intuition of all the things, but you can start making tremendous strides in your current job itself. If you look closely at the data, pick up an unsolved problem, take some data, create as many new attributes and views as you can, and then you just keep looking at them in Excel. More often than not, you will start finding aha moments that are not obvious to your business. A guy who is actually selling, you can go and tell you are target on these guys, you will sell a lot. Now, if you or with Excel, you do in Excel. Nowadays, there are some really wonderful, easy to learn tools like uh, Keep View or Tableau, where you can really look at these views very easily. So, that itself takes you a long way in a data science uh, uh, you know, journey. Just create as many views as possible, look at them. You are bound to find, find very quickly, within a week or so, things that the domain user will say, ah. Right? So, that's the power of now, why are we um, um, emphasizing so much on this? Mm, this is, I think, it captures the sentiment really well. McKinsey said, by in the next four or five years, there will be a shortage of 100,000 data scientists who actually do those math and models. But there will be a shortage of million, approximately I mean, 10 times more, of data smart managers. They, they call them those who can consume data more. That's what I have been trying to stress now. There's going to be a huge shortage of this thing. So it is something that's definitely worth uh, looking at in your, uh, anyone has to start looking at this series. From an IPO perspective, in the EMBA uh, program, we are collaborating to actually launch a data science track where the, we will be uh, covering approximately 100 hours of uh, content so architecting, what we, will, what we believe are things that make you a data smart manager. 
how do you architect a data science solution? You know, what things you have to take into account, what errors the engineers can do, where a manager has to step in, how you will be an active participant in the project and not a passive boss. You know, so that's uh, what uh, this will teach. And of course, some hands on this is a mandatory thing because you're dealing with business breaking um, patterns. One good pattern can mean recently we found uh, we built a model where each each percentage improvement was around five million dollar gain for the client. So one extra pattern can be a game changer. So a manager has, has to be hands on because you are dealing with some of your the core secrets, and we will teach some you know a good hands on uh, model. And then of course a lot of data science is about telling the results in a compelling way to the business unit, to other consumers, stakeholders, who are not probably as good as you uh, in data science. So we'll focus a lot on that. And then there are many things, you know, you are now talking about uh, um, health records of individuals, financial records of individuals, how they search or browse the web. And everything that is very personal, uh, you now look at uh, we have great detail from lots of angles. You know everything about it. You know it's scary to know how much we, Google knows about us. <laughs> you know, so it's better to not really think about it. Uh, so um, as a, as someone dealing with billions and billions of records about millions and millions of people, you need to know what are the complexities. Where do I getting this data itself is a huge problem from an industry perspective. You have to design the most cost effective solution. For a data scientist, you know, he, once you give this method or what problem to solve, they will do the math. But how do you design that entire system? How do you ensure the, sec the secrecy, privacy, uh, confidentiality? Um, that's all a very important aspect. So all those will be covered. Um, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, any questions about data science in general and the method of looking at the problems? Solutions, elaborate. Oh, um, in fact, there are many open source tools. So you may have heard about Hadoop uh, system. That's uh, an entire thing. But there is a very nice open source tool called R. R, the English letter R. You have time for a small story? Yeah. Okay. So there is a, uh, in 1983, when Kernigan and Ritchie, uh, were writing a software for computer programming, they called it C. At the same time, in the same lab, some other group was working on a uh, language for statistical programming. What would they call that? R. No, why did they call that? S. This is C, that is S. So S was developed. And then they kept developing it, developing it. It started being used by many people. Unlike C, the S guys, you know, there are statisticians and there are business users, right? So there are some pure guys and there are some guys who thought about money. <laughs> so the guys who thought about money, they said, hey, you know what, let's make it uh, commercial. Let's not keep it open source anymore. But the guys who said, you know, who are developing it for the sake of developing said, no, 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 let's just keep it out for free. So they decided to split. Those who wanted to make it commercial called their version of S, S plus. And you know they built a nice UI around it, and they started selling it. S plus was then later like procured by Tipco, and even now it's a very popular one. Now this other team that was doing S has, you know, if there is a product called S plus in the market, you can't call yourself S. It's like accepting defeat, right? So they had to call themselves as the next version of S. They must have thought we're going the other way. That's why instead of calling themselves T, they call themselves R. Otherwise, why would you call the next version of STAR? I would have called it T, but I don't know. I mean, this is never discussed in any paper. This is my guess. But R is the next version of S. Um, it's uh, one of the advantages of R is as it was open source and it had an excellent tool to plot graphs. University professors started using it left, right, and center. It had a C-like programming environment and uh, uh, amazing graphical interface. So, if SAS, SPSS, S plus have 100 scientists working on it, developing the models, R has 100, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 scientists working on it for free. So, there's no, it's not a fair competition. So, R is just way ahead in terms of amount of libraries available. 
And the good news is they built some nice, easy Excel kind of interfaces where without any coding you can do the model. You don't even need to write a line of program. Just take the data from Excel, import it, start building models really easy. So when we are talking about model building, that's what those tools are. But amazing tools are there. So um, you really, in fact, that is the problem. Nowadays, you see guys using deep learning and there's the support for information without knowing what it is. Because it's so easy to use. <laughs> tools actually have spoiled uh, a bit. Uh, so you every prediction you have to take with a pinch of salt. But that's yeah. Fantastic tools. Any other questions? So you talked about the safety attribute. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I'm visualizing it using the frame of the three of the attributes. Mm -hmm. And three of the customers who are probably more or more valuable customers. But instead of that start looking at the other attributes, they actually fall behind. Mm -hmm. So you have to so you have to be very careful, look at everything you say. You know, this guy is a very good guy. If their gender is this and uh, um, whatever is the uh, income is this, but at the same time, if the education level is low, if that is added, actually they become much worse. So, yes, so different modeling can different views. Typically, I get a 2% success. So, if I draw 100 views, two of them are breathtakers. It's like photography, right? If you see, really, I, when I click a photo, I just click one. But really professional guy, tuck, 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 he keeps looking. I mean, why do you need so many photos? But then they know after 100, they'll get one or two that is really good. So same thing with data scientists. You know, you spend a lot of time keep looking at it. Finally, you hit. And but when you hit, you hit hard. That one insight can change the game forever. So this is an iterative process. Even model building is same. You build the model, keep refining it, refining it, and then finally you get the um, answer somewhere. And some, you know, Obama attributed his first win to social media, second win to analytics. He actually took the entire batch of Stanford MBA analytics guys in his uh, Chicago office. All they did was to look at the data, and they found patterns that are amazing. Uh, in California, the most influential group is women between 35 and 45 working, um, working women are my most influenceable crowd so they can be moved from Republican to Republican. So in California, his data guess what, George Clooney. <laughs> you, you know exactly who that, you know? So an amazing level of detail went into his campaign. And then, this, this is the fact, so when they use it, you, you will be scared with the level of detail that they get into. Uh, similarly, in some other region, he had the entrepreneurs or the startup companies, quite a few, or mid sized companies. So he took an industrial, industrialist, you know, where they are looking for networks as his dinner guest. Romy actually spent a lot more money, but this guy actually sent me, spent based on patterns. So search for a pattern, pattern, and then, uh, uh, you know, you get one good pattern, you change it. Um, Ah, good question. So, is that the question? Or yes, the, yeah. So, his question is what is big data? Is it teradata, gigabyte, megabyte, petabyte? It's a good question, right? Interestingly, this definition changes with time. In 1988, I remember my brother, he was in IIT Madras, he took me to a room this big with a big computer. He said, This can, you know, unbelievable, hold 200 megabytes. So, man, that was, so 210 megabytes was big data in 1988. 1998, probably 200 gigabytes was big data. Now, 200 terabytes is probably big data. So, a simple definition for us is, if the data cannot be fitted in a single server, to put the data itself, I have to plan service, that is big data. So, I have to start planning about where to put the data, then I'm dealing with big data. If I can dump it into one system, I'm okay. So, which means that, uh, you know, the big data size varies with time. So, what is big data today will become small data. So, today I would say 200 gig is probably big data, anything about that. Yeah. So, statisticians are different from data science. Very good question. Actually, statisticians used to hate data science and they never thought it was a love hate. 
rather hate it. No, no. Um, the pro see, statisticians are very nice people, actually. So when they are building a model, they actually hypothetically build a model. Okay, they assume certain things, and they came up, they come up with a hypothesis based on those assumptions. They do experiments and collect data to either validate or invalidate these hypotheses. So I start with a model that if the uh, size of the uh, animal, let's say I'm doing animal classification, if the size of the animal is bigger than two meters, height is uh, more than three meters, I come up with a model saying, you know, looking at many elephants, I take the data and the pigs, I make the data, and I come up with a model that says, if it is less than this, it's an elephant, and pig and it's more than this, is an elephant. Data scientists, on the other hand, don't spend that time. We write a program, we ask it, look at all patterns that are probably uh, statistically significant. No model, no hypothesis. You generate the hypothesis, right? These guys actually spend a lot of time to generate the hypothesis, and use the data to validate the hypothesis. Computer data scientists use the data to generate the hypothesis. That's why these guys hate them. That's incorrect. That's so wrong. You know, you don't have any basis. You ask me, why is Dow soap buyer buying a Barbie doll? The statistician will never say such things. Data scientists say, yeah, you know what, if that's what the data says. So what is your problem? So that is the fundamental difference. And second difference is, Statisticians traditionally work with small data sets because of the way the field has been done. So they have what is called a sample on which they build the model, which they believe will be validated to population. Data scientists, on the other hand, and is all. I don't take a sample. I showed you that thing, right? That is on all 100,000 customers in five years. It's not a model. It's actually on the entire data. I said, okay, that, that's what the data says. So that's another thing. So computing and data science go a lot more hand in hand uh, than the statistics and data science. But a very important question. But nowadays, statistics has become an integral part of data science. I mean, you use it, uh, if you are building any serious model, you can say. For a high level model, it's not like cloud soap or yeah. shampoo, right? For something which is uh, $400,000 mm -hmm. or $3,000, uh, say a software yeah. product, yeah. is uh, big data, data science happening? It does in the sense that data science happens. Big data, you know, there will be fewer buyers. See, very few buyers. Very few buyers. Actually, you hit a very important point here. Big data is actually very easy. With today's technology, dealing with 200, 500 gigabytes of data is easy. For me, the toughest problem is nano data. If you ask me, in the past 10 years, probably I worked on around 50, 60 interesting data science problems. If you ask me to name the toughest one, it is finding patterns in nuclear leakage. In entire 1900 to 2000, six nuclear leaks happened. Only six. But I can't ask for more. I wish I had more, I can't do that. I'm, I'm glad that only six times it happened. But now imagine I have six rows and they collected around 20,000 features, 20,000 columns, and I have to now start searching for patterns. So that has a whole new level of complexity, but today's data science is perhaps 100 miles ahead of where we were in 2005 itself in solving such problems. So today, if you give me 10 rows of data, I'm not scared. I can actually solve that problem much better than I was able to solve four or five years back, not even 10 years back. So yes, your question is, on very low nano data problems, data science is highly applicable. I mean, the, the field that uses it, extra nuclear leakage is a very outlier in this thing. But the real field that uses it is biology. The genome thing, they have 10 cancer patients. And if you do the genome analysis, 10,000 uh, uh, attributes for 10 rows. And they spend a lot of time on looking at those factors. So yes, it's extensively. Joint family to 
cannot see by looking at the wave tube. Yeah. Yeah. It's all your data tells you it's a joint family, joint family, joint family. Yeah. Right? And your, your the trend is more towards nucleus one. Yeah. Ah, so now how yeah, okay. So um so it's a, you actually make me feel bad slightly because uh, I am part of the extinct uh, species. I live in a giant family. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, let's live with that. Yeah, he is dying. He is becoming extinct. So this is a very important question. And essentially, what he is asking is, when will the model die? How, what is the longevity of a model? All right. That, again, in uh, around ten years back, when I built a model. It would live for two, three years. I have to treat it so likely here and there. But you know, it would live for two, three years. But now, uh, every quarter or every month, I have to check. Some disciplines, every week, I have to check. The, the Twitter, the text mining, they're, they're inventing new words every two days. You know, neologism. That, there's a word called neologism. Interestingly, that's a very old word. <laughs> you know? uh, um, so, 250 year old back, someone came up with the word neologism, which is used in Twitter, coming up with new things, new words. But how do I actually now build a language model that understands Twitter? If Twitter is coming up with new words every day, I have to reinvent the model every day. So, depending on the discipline, I update my model. Typically, in a consumer kind of a setting, where probably most of you work, every quarter we tweak the model. And typically what a business user has to do is you should take the hunches that are generated or the knowledge that is generated by the model and you should constantly validate as and when you get the historical data real at some point and see when these hunches are becoming extinct. And you know, if they don't suddenly, very rarely they will be very active today and they die tomorrow. Very rarely that happens. But then normally the, the relevance comes down and the relevance comes down. And you have to draw a line saying, you know what, it used to be 90% accurate, so I believe it bit my business. Now it is only 55%. And hence, uh, I have to know. But this is a constant job of a uh, data smart manager on to see when to go for the, when to build the model. Like anything else. Now, the only thing that's public is change. Right? Another, another problem is like, what data? Yeah. But that is actually, interestingly, that's one more difference between a statistician and a data scientist. Statistician spends a lot of time on what data to find. Data science, on the other hand, we, we are spoiled by the computing power, right? So we take, a, give me as much as you have. Now, I will run an algorithm to tell me what data is important, then run another thing to tell me the patterns again, with no model. So it's not as huge a problem. Collect as much as you can. The problem is, if the data point is not there in the collected data, problem is not if I have a lot of attributes. I can handle 200,000 attributes on a uh, laptop to use. 200,000, so it's no, no worries at all. So there's one question, is there also like a sort of, uh, has someone also solved that whole problem that for this case we should have, we should get data on, you know, on data Yes, but again what he says, it keeps changing. You can't solve it forever, but your experience, you start with, you know, I work a lot in manufacturing, healthcare, some problems, then I know what data I have to start going with. Now, business user will have a lot of domain inputs, and then we sit and do together. And nowadays, there are techniques where machine generates uh, 100,000 new attributes. Um, and so you put all of them together. So it's solved in certain ways, but still is a qualitative. How do, you, how do you measure and verify the last of data? Uh, <coughs> there are, exactly. So, you, uh, one is statistics allows us to do whether there are outliers or not. When you are plotting, suddenly some points do this, some points do this, then uh, that is not quality. Then you see single version of truth. Uh, you look at records that are very close uh, and slightly varying, then you uh, address that. In fact, this is a very, very good point that you raised. <clears throat> if we were honest, I think data scientists as such, like many other uh, professions, are also egoists. So we want to look good, so we call ourselves data scientists. But a correct description of our job is data janitors. So we clean data all the time. 50, 60% of the time we clean data. And then we work. So it's a 
that's what we spend a lot of time. We take inputs from the business user, we look mathematics, we look at the data, we view it, and then one area which developed really well in the past is the visualization in the past couple of years. So you can really get nice views of the data. Get, uh, the, you know, uh, one of the things that I encourage you is to look at these tableaus and click views of the world. They really are simple and uh, move you a long way in the term of learning. Within two, three years, you will master. One last question. Yeah. What? My question. Oh, question. Okay. So, I thought I talk and got it. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, so, when I entered, I mean, I did, I think so. When I entered, I did real stuff. I kept on hearing the phrase, so it's not rocket science, it can't yeah. be done that. Yeah. It can't be complex. Yeah. So, my question to you, given your background, you're really part of it, we are in building markets. Yeah. Is building markets really that complex? <laughs> Um, uh, yes, the, the complexity lies in the number of things that can go wrong. So, uh, the, a, a typical, uh, you must be familiar with Six Sigma, right? right? Yeah. Why Six Sigma is important? In a mobile phone, you have uh, 500 components. Now, Six Sigma is maybe building something, with, let's say if I build with 99% uh, quality, if I have one product, 100, I make 99 in the group. But if I have 10 components, each one has only 99, probability tells me that overall is 0.99 times 0.99 times 0.99, which is only 90%. So I build 100, 90 will be fine. In a mobile phone, 450 components are there. So 0.99, 0.99 will be 0.3 or something. So I have to go for 0.9999 acres. If in a rocket, I have 150 power. So 0 0.99, 0 .9, even 6 sigma is not in effect. I have to go for 7 sigma, 0 0.9999999. 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. So that if I build 1,000 rockets, one can go wrong. Right? By the way, but that is nothing compared to God's plan. How many of you don't believe in God? Let me do a sermon at the end. <laughs> okay. You don't believe. So I'll try to convert you, sir. I don't know. So, so if rocket science is so difficult, because 100,000 components are there, to do one out of 1,000, I have to work at 0.999999 accuracy. A human genome has 3 billion components. So in the God's factory, what uh, system he is practicing or she is practicing, I, uh, I compute here. He is at 12.5 sigma. 0.9999999999. Unless he does that, every one out of two, if he was only at six sigma, one out of two people should have three legs, four hands. You know, it should be a arbitrary thing. At seven sigma, one and ten. At twelve sigma, you get the current ratio one in hundred thousand. With all the mess up that we are doing with the artificial food and the, you know feeding um, uh, meat to cows, whatever we are doing, even with that, we are so healthy because God is working at twelve sigma. So seriously consider. <laughs> Thank you for a fantastic, exciting talk. So I think uh, some of us woke up after the talk. <laughs> uh, before the talk would have been better. <laughs> but uh, I want to invite Professor Tikesh to announce the stage. Oh, it's, it's, it's perfect. Uh, this is not so good enough appreciation for Thank you very much.